big crowd today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So go. Go. All right. Well, my name is Carl Ott. I guess most of you know me. So we're here to talk about what today, and uh, we have this, these pictures up. So uh, what's common? Right. We have this. Uh, we have this funny thing hooked up to an Arduino. We have a Kinect. We have this drone, of course. We have some kind of car. We have this robot-looking thing. We have this, we have this uh, military thing ready to shoot the drone down and a robot ready to clean it up. So, uh, but there is something all common between these, right? And the common thing is that uh, they're all measuring distance with light. And that's what today's civil chat is about. So I'll go through uh, what I've got and then Doug has some pretty specific examples and we'll talk through those. So, um, Let's talk about like some of the different ways you can measure distance with light. So the first would be simple uh, intensity, right? So uh, so you have this. Uh, um, you know we've all seen them. I think everybody here is pretty much familiar with them. To turn on the pointer thing. Where's the pointer thing? There's the pointer thing. So we have this uh, standard package. It has a LED and a photo transistor. And then in the schematic, it looks like that. So this is actually from the uh, from this robot here, the schematic in the base. It's got a, a comparator, and it's got a uh, potentiometer, and it's got a little LED. So when I turn this guy on, right, so uh, when you get your hand close, it, uh, it, it toggles this little LED in the bottom. So uh, trouble is, of course, that these things get fooled by ambient light pretty easily, so these are unusable in my house, because for whatever reason, they turn the lights on, and it thinks it's about to run into something. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the simplest way to measure. So let's go to the next way. Um, let's talk about triangulation, right? So now, you know, if you've got these lights coming in at an angle, you've got a, a light this way, and uh, it's going to bounce, and we know from the laws of physics, it's going to bounce at the same angle. So if the object's close, it'll hit this guy. If the, if the same object is further away, then the light will bounce and hit that guy. So now you know based on which detector gets the light about how far away the thing is. Okay, so some of the systems we have um, use that. They can make it a little more complicated, right? They'll have uh, a whole array of elements instead of just two, and they'll have lenses, which just mix, mix up the whole, uh, whole by inverting the image and screwing things up. And then we have, you know, it's so hard to find good uh, images these days because I don't know who, who saw light behave this way in physics. That's not what I learned. You don't hit something straight on and then bounce off at an angle. It's, it just doesn't work that way. But, yes, but just, it does. That's what the experts say. For a perfectly reflective surface? No. Okay. It, that's, like it reflects in every direction. For a real thing? Yeah. For real. For real. Yeah, show it. But for a a perfectly example, ideal right. mirrored surface. No, not no. mirrored. No, rough surface. So this is a real surface. It's I mean, a rough surface. surface. Yeah. yeah. So it's shining in every direction. Yeah. But you're only interested in the one that comes back at you. The one that comes back at you. I'm just saying, when I see blocks like this, I think this is the ideal world, and then we'll talk about real. So <laughs> I, I don't map this to a real in my brain. This is ideal. Except it's not ideal. It's real. It's real. I hate these diagrams. <laughs> it's real, Carl. You, you keep thinking of okay. paired surface. Now you're going to tell me that this is real. So let, let's talk about the next method, right? So time of flight. So uh, let's say you could start the laser and you start a stopwatch. And it comes and it, uh, of course, it's, it's real light. So it sees the wall and it takes a nice gentle turn around. It comes back like that, right? And then you lap your stopwatch. And uh, then you know how far it is because you know the speed of light. And uh, what I didn't mention is that this is actually where I started my career some time back. That little uh, picture of the military vehicle, uh, the first circuit I did was a, a circuit that would use a stopwatch. It, it actually was the stopwatch circuit for the laser rangefinder. And that vehicle like that, we could tell how far a target was away from about 50 meters out to 10 kilometers with a single pulse of light. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that circuit had, uh, I did it in uh, 74 LS logic, you know, not the fastest so silicon. It was pretty fast in the day, right? That was, it was a 30 megahertz circuit 
when the fast processor was 12 megahertz, right? Yeah. Unless you go buy a 286 that has 16. <laughs> and here, I, so I was feeling pretty good running 30 megahertz. Um, so what does that mean? If uh, two round trips of light, or one round trip of light, uh, so one kilometer target is a two kilometer round trip, that's about 6.7 microseconds, which uh, at a 30 megahertz clock uh, is about 200 counts, and that gives you a resolution of about five meters of distance. So that's kind of cool. Except, we, I mean, we know really, real light doesn't see a wall coming and take a nice gentle turn. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, anybody heard the term corner cube before? Yep. Okay, for those that haven't, Here's an example of a corner cube, well, and the, the nice thing about corner cubes are that um, when you have these 90 degree angles, it doesn't matter what angle the light hits because it'll come back. It'll come straight back at you. So this is the way I like to think of that diagram because it's a little more real for ideal things. Um, and it's kind of cool, right, because these are actually made up with many, many thousands of little corner cubes in there. Hmm. Um, they might not be shaped quite like that, but in effect, that's how. And the same thing with the reflective paint on the streets. Mm. And uh, like I mentioned at the other presentation, this is why when you see uh, like the modern warships for radars and stuff, that's why they won't have any 90 degree angles anywhere. Yeah. Because 90, 90 degree angles will tend to catch and reflect radar, yeah. which is bad if you don't want to be seen. Yep. It's good if you want to be seen. Yeah. Mm. So that's why these are not on warships. <laughs> I'm good. All right, so uh, interferometry, right? So, so now this gets a little more complicated, a little more interesting in a way. Um, so you have this CW laser, so it's always on, and you have a beam splitter. So some of the light comes up here and then comes back down to the detector. Some of the light comes out, hits the target, comes back, hits the detector. And now if this target moves a little bit, it's going to cause constructive and destructive interference of the light at the photodetector. So now you can measure with the wavelength of the light over two, you can, you can measure how far the target is or its variation. So where could we use that, right? So I'm thinking if you go back to those gravity times, waves. gravity waves, or how about uh, um, spy craft? So you're trying to eavesdrop on something going on yeah. behind a window. Yep. So you shine a laser at the window. Now the air pressure in the room is making the window vibrate. So that's making this modulate. So you demodulate the light, and now you can eavesdrop on what's going on inside, what people are saying inside of them. Yeah. Um, yes, and then there's a, I think there's a variation of this that will come up later too. But um, Those are kind of like the main methods that I, I jotted down. There's all kinds of variations on a theme to those. Of course, they're all subject to this uh, specular reflection, right? Like a perfect thing. All, all wavelengths of light get reflected ideally at, at the same angle. And then there's the real world, which I, I agree exists, right? Diffuse reflections. And then you've got transmission, right? So the atmosphere will scatter it and attenuate it. Um, and then the laser, if you're using the laser, the laser has a natural divergence to the beam. Um, so some of these effects, they're going to make a big difference if you're out in a tank trying to measure on a target 10 kilometers away, like when I was starting my career. These are probably not going to come into as much effect if you're here in a room and you're trying to measure the end of the can can course. Yeah. So bottom line is, is that they're all real world effects and uh, noise, range, accuracy, second law of thermodynamics, right? It's just, it's just a matter of how much you lose. Um, so, of course, lots of applications, uh, distance vibration, we know, we, you know, we talk about these every day, right, so I read them off. Mapping, depth sensing, um, some of the interesting ones uh, that came up uh, when I was pulling this together, because that tiny LiDAR sensor, the SD part, was uh, user detection for laptops. So, they'll have these kind of sensors built in, so if you're not around, then they'll throttle down to save your battery, save energy. Or, uh, you know, you walk up and you got to get the soap in the bathroom, right? So it's, it's measuring your hand or gestures, gesture detection, camera focus, uh, auto assist. 
Um, this is a, uh, I'm pretty sure this is from a, um, a point cloud made from a LiDAR of some kind, 3D LiDAR. And uh, it's kind of a cool image, right, the false colors. But if you look closely, you can see the shadows, the black shadows. And you can almost deduce from the angles where the LiDAR must have been. Because uh, you can see through, you can see through this uh, planner. So it must have been coming around here kind of like at this angle and, and down. So it's kind of fun to play with. I think as Steve was talking about uh, other applications, your issue at, at your house where the, uh, um, the water level drained in the lake. So now they got to do some volume estimation. And uh, this happens in stockpiles, I think, uh, on the real world too. Um, you get, get all these big raw materials, whether it's salt for the roads or whatever, construction materials. So how, do you, how, much, how many cubic yards is in there? Well, they'll fly a drone around with these LIDARs, and then they'll, they'll make a point cloud, and then they'll integrate in the point cloud, figure out what's the volume of that pile of stuff, or the missing water. Or the missing stuff. <laughs> the missing <laughs> stuff. Missing dirt. So uh, it's all measuring, measuring distance with plate. Um, these are here, so I put up on the wall uh, presentation. If you want all the links, there's a Bitly link you can download. Get the links here. Um, there's just some interesting stuff. We'll, I'll show a couple of these videos talking about uh, automotive use cases, talking about Ford and GM using LiDAR, but Tesla's not. Mm -hmm. Um, who knows what Uber's not doing? Well, <laughs> Uber apparently was putting their lighter instead of having seven like the competitors. Uber had one, and instead of having a good field of view, their one lighter, the closest they could see anybody was like 12 feet, oh, or wow, or or more. <laughs> so is that what the problem was? Uh, one article I read, yeah. Mm. Um, depth sensing cameras. So at the very first slide, you know, it showed to connect. Uh, those are kind of cool too. We can pull one of those links up if we want to take a look at it. Um, let's see. Uh, maker friendly LiDARs, so just a handful of lists here. So if you want to play around, Hackster has some great projects. Quite a few projects to choose from. Um, Doug was pointing out a couple of pretty good options up here. And I think you have one of these on hand today, right, Doug? The, Maker Focus? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's actually a Benny Wake. Okay. Or Benny Wake. Uh, that's the manufacturer, I believe. Because it's named a gazillion things, Maker Focus being one of them. Yeah. But but I think if you get back down, it's. You drill Benny down into it. Yeah. From some Chinese. And I may be pronouncing it wrong. Benny there's, yeah. there's, there's no points in this room, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then light, tiny LiDAR. So, so this is some, um, you know, I hadn't really messed with LiDAR since I left the defense industry some decades ago. So it was really interesting to see this little Kickstarter project and, and know that you guys, that we've been doing it in the club for a while. So um, I reached out to these guys and, and they, uh, after their Indiegogo campaign closed, and, and they said, oh, you're with DPRG. So they sent us a handful of them and they're in the kit box now. And at the gift of the uh, prize, prize. prize box, yeah. prize box. So, uh, so a few of us are playing with them. Um, actually, I took most of the ones in the club and sent them off for reflash. So I can't demo it today, physically. But, but anyhow, uh, it seems like a pretty decent. Are those line of flight or on the angle? Time of flight. Oh, time of flight. Yeah, we'll get into that in the next few slides too, because um, you know they're so small and they have such close range. So it's one thing to have my little 30 megahertz oscillator and range 10 kilometers and, and, and range in, uh, in five meter increments, right? That's, that's one thing in microseconds. But what happens when you're trying to measure a little closer distances? So anybody have a stopwatch? <laughs> okay, pull out your stopwatch. Now when I say go, catch that? How long did it take, right? How long did it take? One half a second. Exactly. It's a half a second. It was one in a second plus a half, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. So, so what does that mean, right? So, if, if we're uh, if we're trying to do a two-inch target, something's two inches away. So that's about a one centimeter round trip out and back. So that's 0.3 nanoseconds. 300 picos. 0.3 nanoseconds. 
Now, who here is trying to measure things in the nanosecond range even? <laughs> like prop delays. Yeah, me too. Because in my 7400 uh, LS yeah. linear range finder, right, 30 megahertz, it's 33 nanoseconds, yeah. I had to worry about the 10 nanosecond prop delay from the clock to the output of the counter because yeah. I couldn't have more than one or two of those levels and I was already in the next clock cycle. Yeah. And that's slow, right? 30 megahertz, what are our processors running at now? Gigahertz. gigahertz yes. So how are you, you going to measure this in such a short period of time? And even, even a two meter target, right? That's still 10 nanoseconds. Yeah. So think about that when we're playing in this course and you can get you know, centimeter, millimeter resolution on distance. How on earth are they doing that? Well, let's come back to the how they're doing it and let's play with some demos first. So the first one, and I have video demos today because as we know, I don't do things physically. <laughs> You only simulate. I just simulate. I'm surprised you're here in person. <laughs> that is a good point. Right? <laughs> don't you realize that's just a hologram? <laughs> I don't think the audio is working, but I think the video is pretty self-explanatory. And this one's pretty cool. So this is a, called a 3D flash LiDAR. <clears throat> and I think it pulls together like some of those mechanisms that we, we talked about earlier. And this is how automotive, uh, some, some cars will do it. So how's it going to build that 3D map? So it can run down the pedestrian and keep the grocery bag standing. That's like 32 by 8 pixels? Yeah, look, look at how it does it though. This is the cool part, because there's no moving parts. So it's mixing time of flight with the triangulation. Is it just doing triangulation or is it just? Both, I think it's doing both, because watch, watch this, right? It'll send out one line. Yeah. It'll get back a line. Right. Right, so now you have depth information for a single line. Right. And now what happens if you index the arrays down See that? Yeah, but it's... So one pulse of light gives you the distance for each one of these elements. So, so then, yeah. Get it? Hmm. Isn't that clever? No moving parts. Oh, yeah. Now, I was looking around. I, I, I couldn't find any that were that would be like suitable for our purposes. Yeah. So, but I figure it's only a matter of time, right? Oh, it's real expensive. Yeah, once it gets in a car, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, just yeah. a matter of time. Carl, what are they selling for right now, just for curiosity's sake? I couldn't find any. I think these okay, are just. So, I think these are just OEM level right at the moment. If you're General okay. Motors, you can buy one. Otherwise, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Yeah. No, I, I'm not the best searcher, so I don't, I don't know exactly. But um, so that's that's at the one extreme, right? That's that's pretty cool. Then this is uh, uh, I have a version of this running, uh, except that the hardware is up in Canada right now getting reflashed. So it's just got a servo, and oops, you can't reflash the yourself. No, no, they locked the chip. So I suspect they've locked the initiative down, and you get a new one. Because that's that's their unique. Uh, I suspect. <laughs> I would say there was a mod that they didn't want the well, average user you doing it. I mean, it's relatively expensive compared to the other options, like what I think Doug's going to go through. Um, there we go. And the reason it's relatively expensive is because, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you know, the, sen the time of flight sensor is just this little piece right here. So most of the volume is taken up by this MCU. So they've written. Even though this thing has, I think it has an I2C port and its own little microcoded API, yeah. uh, they put a wrapper around that <coughs> to make it even more friendly for. for your, your yeah. So you'll, you'll see this and we'll talk about the products, you'll see that in a minute. But um, that's pretty cool, right? It's got a it's little servo, Arduino Uno, and it's measuring. 
I don't like the way they did this, so um, I have changed up the Arduino code and uh, processing code to make it a little more clear as to what it's doing. But that's kind of fun. And then they have another demo they've done. Turn off the autoplay on the top right there. Where is it? Oh, that thing. I always wondered. Okay. Stop. And then this guy. It's uh, on every page. Once oh. you once you set it, it she usually remembers it when I reload really the page. <coughs> I got the parts for this one, so I'll build it after the competition. But take three of these things, I pan until. Now you can do that. So is the only cool Arduino? Sorry? Anything on Raspberry Pis? Well, I think they tend to use Arduinos on this guy. Okay. So, yeah. but um, I mean, they they they've got instructions there on how to hook it up to your your Raspberry Pi. It's just I2C. Anything they can talk I2C. Yeah. It's a matter of how much work you got to do with the libraries, but I think they have some out there if you'd like to use them. So are those are those sensors like facing just slightly outward so you can determine when you are not well no I don't think so because um, they they got a twenty seven degree coverage. I, oh well, they do. I don't think it's that either. Well, okay, yeah, so uh, yes, I agree with you. So here's um, when you look at the sky, like the the circuit cards themselves are in a flat plane. No, oh, they are. Okay. They're in a flat plane, but the emitter, which is which is coming out from here, is shooting out normal with like a 27 degree field of view cone. Hmm. So they're just looking for the like the shortest distance then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We orient this so that the distance is equal between all sensors. Mm -hmm. Whatever the distance may be. So that's kind of cool. And when you buy uh, at least couple of these, they'll usually ship that, they'll throw that little uh, connector card in with the yeah. daughter card. They try to encourage you to buy more. <laughs> so we have several of these in the club, in the gift box, and between Dave and I, I bought a few myself. Um, so they seem pretty responsive, they seem like a nice, nice bunch of guys together. From what I understand, ST is coming out with a longer distance version. You yeah. know, we, uh, I actually have, uh, Presentation on that that I can I can flip through here after this because it's got some more interesting things getting deeper into that family of sensors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is talking about it. You can see its size with respect to a quarter. Um, let's see, and then 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 it gets uh, pretty interesting in terms of what's inside. How does it actually do that? Right? Because 0.3 nanoseconds. How how can I measure that? So, um, so it's using this array of they call them spads, single photon avalanche diodes. So these things, these things are so sensitive that a single photon can cause it to trigger. But of course, how are you gonna know that that's the photon I want to measure? No, that I didn't want to measure. I wanted to measure that other photon. So, so then it gets complicated because now you got to figure out which collection of photons are you gonna are you gonna look at compared to which other collection of photons. So, um, um, so those spads, I have some other things to share on that in a minute. Uh, it's got this 940 nanometer surface emitting laser. Uh, the coolest thing of all that I learned in pulling this together was that, you know, soap dispensers I get, camera autofocuses I get, but if you haven't, who, who has an iPhone 7 Plus? Anybody but me? <laughs> okay, if you look at your speaker, you ever notice that little round thing above the speaker? Yeah. Guess what's behind there? It's, one, it's a laser rangefinder. It's got a stinking laser rangefinder so that it knows, oh, I'm getting too close to his head, I should turn the volume down so I don't blast his ear out and cause tinnitus. <laughs> so they're coming with laser, laser rangefinders, and I'm thinking, from this tank that I did that could range 10 kilometers to, okay, that's too close. <laughs> this is messed up. So, and then there's a seminar, we'll pull up in a minute the slides from it, so uh, ST Micro, which is this particular model we're talking about, they've shipped some 450 million of these sensors. <laughs> 450 million. Either as cheap as they are. My phone just uses its camera 
and it images the ear <laughs> and knows how far. It doesn't need that stinking iPhone <laughs> technology. It's, it's just a hundred dollar Android phone, but it can see my ear. And Are you sure it doesn't care about the Maybe I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you won. <laughs> I knew there was some BS. Okay, yeah. okay so, but, so how far can he, can he detect? Like, if you want to you see you build something, and uh, you maybe like you um, thirty miles. Can you can you if you go up maybe an object thirty miles with the sensor? I mean, scientists have done this to range off the moon, right? They'll go put a corner cube on the moon. I think some of the early Apollo missions yeah. or there something. Are. Yeah, there and, are some up there. And uh, yeah, like I actually know somebody, somebody who's shined a laser by the name of Jerry Merriman. He holds the patent for the pocket calculator. Okay. Ti guy. Yeah. XTIR. He's used his uh, laser and telescope, and he, he hits the uh, corner cubes on the moon. On the moon, yeah. Yeah, so they're there. But to answer your question, I mean, so just look at, if you look closely at this, I didn't. Oh, I'd like it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is, we have a maker space that's it's not unusable. It's not fit for It's not presentation friendly. I saw a show where they said they picked up reflections up. Listen to the Russian communication. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, here. Is it, there's enough of a reflection that they can pick up. Okay, so if you look closely at this slide, so like this little guy right here, the one that's in the phone, it's only good for under ideal conditions, two meters. I mean, in my dark uh, kitchen, I couldn't get it more than a meter, really. Um, but then this other one, uh, Doug will show it goes uh, 0.3 meters out to 12 meters. So it, it easily does any of the surfaces in this room. And then, and I know this Garmin guy will go out to 40 meters. So it's just a matter of, you know, remember all those practical effects earlier on, right? You, you got to figure out what, what problem you're trying to solve and then pick the sensors and the parts to, to mm -hmm. suit the conditions. Yeah. One of the things you quickly realize once you're using the, the Benuik. The 12 meters is a long way. That's far. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, it's 36, 36 feet. feet. Yeah. You know, and you probably don't really care something that's 120 feet away. 120 meters. You know. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, unless you're, we'll get uh, that for later. Yeah. Unless you're. Uh, unless you're surveying you know or something. Unless you're moving fast. Yeah. 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 Unless you're moving fast. Faster than our road. Moving fast or surveying <laughs> a field or. Yeah. So what's the problem? So, um, yeah, so interesting, really interesting to me that phones are, are having that. So inside of this guy, um, you can see the, uh, 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 well, so the external interface, uh, so it's got firmware and an I2C interface it expects you to have. But inside here, it's got some uh, 200, 200 uh, uh, SPAD, 200 of the detector elements in an array. And uh, from the patents I was reading, I think it's actually a 2D array. I'm not exactly sure how it's used, but um, right, the thing has RAM, ROM, NVM, microcontroller, specialized hardware, array of diodes, all in a piece of silicon. Um, Dave went and found the patents for this guy. Yeah. Um, but we were scratching our heads as to, okay, how is it measuring distance? Yeah. Well, I looked a little further and I saw at the very top it referenced this other patent. Oh, okay. And when I did a Google search for that patent, everybody in, on the planet is referencing this other plant patent. <laughs> and if you, go, if you go reach into this patent, then you start to see that um, it's using some crazy combination of the effects that I mentioned earlier on. So they'll actually modulate the light going out. and um, they're doing uh, different variations of patent can do uh, TDMA, CDMA. <laughs> so they're, they're doing all kinds of, uh, they're, they're actually Thank using the, the phase detection stuff as well as the amplitude. Hmm. And, uh, and parts of the, some of the pulses they use to cal calibrate the ambient light, and then some they use to measure the re return. <laughs> I don't know, it, it's more than I wanted to dig into, but yeah, it's interesting stuff. To, I mean, how do you do that so inexpensively? Because mm -hmm. that, it's got to be one of the le less expensive parts in this phone, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's just crazy. Just a dumb question, but uh, 
I'm having a hard time with this, uh, measuring photon. Isn't there like a quantum thing where if you measure it, it's not there anymore? Yeah, well, I think while well, you're talking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, yeah. that, that you can't measure both the location and the speed at the same time. Oh, the act of uh, looking at it changes it. Uh, yeah. yeah, the act of measuring it. But you don't care. It. You, don't you don't care. care. A photon, like your eye can see a single photon. Well, certain sensors in the eye can yeah. be triggered on a photon. So, it so doesn't care. Look. It ruins it, but it detects it. Yeah. I think we can chalk this safely up to marketing blurbs, right? Because these things, apparently, uh, they'll, they'll, the way I'm reading it, in theory, and, and there's some links here on how, the, on how, the, uh, how these things work, so you can read in more depth. And I think that what, what it really means is that in, in practice, the, in practice the, uh, the physics work out so that a single photon could trigger the diode in a way that you could detect it. Yeah. But in practice, it's not very practical. You need to have a bunch of photons. So when the guy, when the guy did the seminar on the new version of this, he said, well, you've you got to let me um, send out a bunch of pulses of light. So each one of these range measurements, he said, takes about um, 500,000 or a million pulses of light to go out in a train before he has enough, before he's accumulated enough photons so that he can estimate what the range is. So he's interpolating. Oh yeah. <laughs> so oh, it, yeah. it might have something to do with narrowing when you expect a photon, I'm guessing. Yeah. In other words, Time if you're just sitting there collecting photons, you're getting hosed to death. But if you're looking at, at what happens Specific within pins. a certain picosecond, yeah. then that's not going to be quite a... But now, now you've got the next problem, right? Because, because uh, like if you go back to my my simple where I started the career, I mean we sent out one blip of light, yep. but even but even and even though um, we could switch pretty quickly, so like, like we'd have on a CO2 laser, so here you can imagine a CO2 laser cavity that's about a foot long, right? And it's about four inches in uh, on a square side, and inside it had this super high pure CO2 gas, and then it had electrodes on top and bottom which were very um, carefully smoothed and polished so that they had no sharp edges. And what you do is you, you charge up this capacitor to 20,000 volts. And then, um, then you had a switch, which uh, we used a spark gap. Mm -hmm. okay. And it, a spark gap is a thing where it has an electrode and an electrode, and then it has another one in the middle that's closer to one than the other. So what happens is, is and it's in, a, it's in a, a cavity that's got some well-controlled atmosphere of some kind, or no atmosphere. And that, there's, there's, the calibration was such that you could put 20,000 volts against the, uh, across the outer electrodes, uh, electrodes, nothing would happen. So then what you do is you take and put a meager 1,000 or 2,000 volts on this middle one, yeah, and, and it would be, you put the 2,000 volts here that's below this point, and now you cause such a field between these two electrodes that it would draw an arc. So all of a sudden you'd have this spark that, that goes from like megaohms of impedance down to 10 ohms of impedance. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden now is, is how long? It's 10 nanoseconds. So now you can imagine here you've got this foot long cavity, right? And it's going from a megaohm impedance to a 10 ohm impedance. And you're putting 20,000 volts across 10 ohms in about 80 nanoseconds. So um, just think of the EMI, right? Because that's on one side of an aluminum plate. On the underside of the aluminum plate is this detector that is capable of, of, of measuring microvolts and microwatts because that's what the light is like after it hits 10 kilometers and comes back. Yeah. Probably, probably Signal to noise ratio is a little bit of a problem. Probably enough to raise the hair on your head, right? It was. It was, it, was, it was very interesting. Let's, let me just say it was a great way to learn about electromagnetic compatibility. Because, I mean, it's a 12-foot loop, right? And you're, you're forcing 800 amps through it. It's, it's just broadband noise because it's an arc. Yeah. It's consciously an arc. Yeah. So, um, and then this, the capacitors, what we've learned was that the uh, capacitors, uh, after, a, after a, a shock like that, they go, right? They'd, they'd, uh, they'd have little degradations inside. Uh, so that they'd have little internal shorts throughout the capacitor body. But those, it was a kind of uh, a, a material that would self-heal by the time the next 15 hertz pulse came around to do it again. So, um, and, but meanwhile, like, it would just ring. So you'd have all this, it, there's impedance, right? Yeah. Or uh, inductance, it, 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 it was a resonator. Yeah. It was, it was an electromagnetic resonator, not just a light resonator. So the, 
the EM stuff would resonate. So, so here's this capacitor. It just, it could just keep glitching, and it would start glitching out at the same time when we were expecting to see pulses back. So it was false triggering my stopwatch until we shut down the EMC problems. Yeah. So, so that's that's why this is so fascinating to me because it's just, I mean it's in, it's in a phone. Yeah. And it's not twenty thousand volts. But it's not a foot long. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it works. Most of the tank. Very yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So so single photons. Just I mean, I think they can technically measure a single photon, but it doesn't do you any good. Yes. So they'll send out a million pulses of light, then they'll do some fancy. Talk about demodulating a pulse train to figure out actually, and it might vary. They might vary the frequency and the the, uh, the coding mechanism that was sent out in the pulse train. Um, so I guess it's like an interferometer type approach. I mean, that was the the method I'd seen years and years ago to measure yeah. accurate distances. Yeah. With you know, you would have a beam splitter and you'd have a wave go out, come back, and then you'd look at the you know the interference patterns. I guess really would be one way to. Think yeah, but that 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 will only get you uh, within a wavelength. Yeah, within a wavelength of where it is. Well, it, that's it pretty measure. good. That's no, awesome. I'm saying it doesn't measure distance. I mean, right. from here here to you, you don't know how many wavelengths there are. Oh, but okay. you can okay. measure a fraction of a wavelength with it. Okay. So this is so this this must be putting those mechanisms together. Yeah. Because they do talk about phase phase demodulation. As well as amplitude measurements. Well, one of the very early ah, yeah. um, altimeter approaches was to send out a uh, radar chirp, and then the wave that came back of comparing the, or actually using the chirp that came back versus what you're sending out, and the difference in the frequency was the altitude. Yeah, and they, and they talk about this in, in the patent as well. Yeah, they, so, like when when I did the rangefinder years back, we would we would uh, just do a simple threshold detection on the rising edge of the pulse. Right. Which, of course, um, depending on how big the pulse is, that adds the error of the pulse yeah, time time. to your measurement. Um, and what they talk about in this patent of getting around that is that there's a way of uh, not looking at the front side but the back side, and somehow that can increase the accuracy. Hmm. Um, is there any relation to the astrophysics guys that can see planets and other suns? I don't know. That's beyond my degree. Because, I mean, they're doing, <laughs> that, I think they're measuring some of the stuff that's coming back, and they can tell that. Yeah, teams well, they, they're they're measuring, aren't they measuring wobble? Or, yeah. they, or do they do other stuff now? They, they measure they a variation in, in intensity from the star. Okay, that's it. But they do, um, I think they do rely on, you know, we, we, we use lasers to make highly collimated light, right? So it's, it, it does diverge, but it... Not very much. Not very much. Um, but what will happen is that when you get a star that's how many thousands of light years away, by the time the light reaches you, it's essentially collimated. So it behaves like a laser, even though it came from a star in all directions. And I think they can use that property plus the wavelength, and they can end the diffraction. And I think they figure. Well, I'm, I'm not an optics guy. They may guy. look at it for a long, long time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's statistical long. measure. Lots of yeah, okay. Well, not only that, but you know, the Earth goes around the Sun, you know, once a year, and it would, if you were out there looking at it, you would see it dim the Sun once a year. So that's how they measure, you know, what the orbit is of these. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. See, so click over a long, long time. If yes. it's a long period, got it. In the years or whatever, and that's where they found some that are in the seconds, right? Or yes. minutes or whatever. Yes, that are really around, speeding fast. Really fast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about GWs? Mm -hmm. GWs, gravitational waves. Oh, that is. Yeah. Binary stars or. Yeah, what, what they have is a L, and they send a light beam down, and a light beam down this one, and they measure the distance, differences in those two beams, and the gravity wave passing through will affect that, and that's how they detected the gravity waves. Yeah, somewhere out in the desert. And yeah, somewhere. 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 Mile long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so um, so that's this is the this is the version of this chip that's uh, in the, in the samples we have in the club. Um, and then I can pull up another slide and flip through quickly. It has uh, variations that would be good to look at. But um, this is what the, on that circuit card, of course, it's just got a tiny little sensor and. Uh, Wherever I read it, I think uh, Apple, they're big enough that they got ST to make a, like a two-thirds or half-size version of this because it's too big for the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then a the 32-bit micro, and then support stuff. Um, I think some, some of you all have spent more time than I have, and how much code space does it take to drive it? The guys that did this project say that it, it takes uh, two and a half times less program space because they've simplified the API. So it's easier to deal with and less memory. Um, this this is also where uh, this other slide I'll pull up is kind of cool because the new the new detector has some pretty interesting modes to it. Um, but they've done some things so that they can uh, they can use it pretty quickly, pretty fast sample rate, uh, and they've compared it to the Pulolu versions using the same sensor. And then these are the uh, again their sponsors so. Twenty-five dollars for that. They have these Grove. They, it, it's nice. It has a Grove uh, connector on the back, so you don't have to solder. You can just put the Grove connector in. And, and, and those Grove connectors you can get at Tanner's. Right. Yeah. Yep. And they've got their three-way mesh <coughs> bracket. Um, and some more links. So let me pull up the uh, let me pull up that presentation. Flip through a couple of slides if I can find my mouse. So, so um, this testing is better than using uh, these uh, sonar, ultrasonic sensors with this one because this one actually you could do you could do distance measurements, you could do uh, obstacle avoidance, you can also do follow more. Well, I mean they're just measuring distance, right? Okay. But your sonar is using audio. Yeah, it's pulses, and, and this is using light. Yeah. So the, the what, difference is the frequency you can run them at. Oh, right, yeah. And their accuracy, and excuse me, even even on these things, uh, in this presentation that, that they gave the webinar, um, somebody was asking about applications because one of the one of the applications is for measuring the level of fluid in a container. And, uh, and they were saying that yes, well, uh, keep in mind that if you're using this to measure oil and gas. This particular sensor will do fine, but if you're measuring water, no luck because the water absorbs or transmits the photons. It doesn't bounce them back. Yeah, so, so this thing can't see water. Yeah. The thing that one of the disappointing things with the VL53 LX L0 or one is you know, okay. So you say you have your sonar unit. Can you measure a meter with your sonar unit? Or 1.2 meters, so that would be with your sonar that you should be able to do that. Um, if you figure out a meter and a half, I believe it takes 33 milliseconds for you to go out and come back with sound. Here we're using here we're using light, and the default. Uh, Nine time is 30 milliseconds or 33 milliseconds. I'll have to, I'm not sure, I got it on my thing. So, and how, how far can they reach? Realistically, about a meter. All right, now the new one, I can't tell you that. Uh, they're supposedly able to read up to two meters. But the point of it is, in your ultrasonic, if you were six inches away from something, you could read it really quick. All right. Otherwise, the faster, the closer you are, the faster you can read it. Now, whether you're polling that correctly to take advantage of that, that's a different story. But uh, if you're not, you know, if you're taking a 20 millisecond loop, that means you're probably going to have to go two loops to get a real a reading. So, no matter what's going on, you know what I mean. Maybe you're lucky; you get a 20 millisecond. So maybe you get it every, you get a reading every every loop around. But it's not like what you would have thought. The whole thing of this that would have been much more cooler about this 
is if I could have gotten a reading every five milliseconds or every one millisecond, that's not, they're not really speeding up your, your space. Otherwise, they're both taking about 30 milliseconds. Yep. All right. Um, and in some targets, you could, a you could actually say that the ultrasonic is a better target detector. So this is not the ultrasonic killer that you, know, you would think initially. If they had, like I said, if it was doing it every one millisecond, then hey, pff, I'd never use another ultrasonic in my life. But that's not what's going on. And uh, now there's other reasons why you might want to use this, okay? But if it's if it's just, you're, it's disappointing that they're going to light and giving you results of sound. Yep. That's that's disappointing. You, you mean in latency? Yeah. 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 Um, won't those two get 100, 100 hertz for rep rate? No. Well, I don't know about the one. The one, well, the one actually can use a faster I squared C, but it's still saying that I think the fastest cycle is still 20 milliseconds, so that's oh, yeah. 50 hertz. Mm -hmm. And the other problem with that is if I double the speed of my I squared C and I still can't speed it up, what that's really telling me is I'm probably sending more crap down the line to and I had to go fast, you know what I mean, to, to send all, the, all of the register info or whatever it is that I'm but sending you down in the thing. two or three or four of those and just interleave so that you're getting samples. Every well, now that's, that's where, that is where this could come. Right. Yeah. In the use of multiple ones. The problem with older Sonic is <laughs> that you really got to go bing, 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 because every time you pulse out, you pollute the air where you pollute the environment. I mean, there's noise going everywhere. All right, so if you try to ping two of them together, you may get lucky, you may not. Yeah. All right, that's also the reason why, you know, the, a lot of the, like the new ping library will say, well, you can cut it off at, you can cut it off after a certain distance, but the noise is still out there. So, you so I mean, again. you know, you. Yeah. That's why if you read the guy that authored the new ping library, he says about the fastest you can go is 33 milliseconds between triggers. Yeah. All right. And you have to go, he has an example where he does 15 ultrasonics. Oh God, I don't know why you'd do that. But anyway, <laughs> 15 ultrasonics. And he's going sequentially. He's, yeah. not, he's not going kachoom. Now, you know, if you were pointed out this way and you were outdoors, you probably could get away with it. Yeah. So that's actually an interesting thing that, that came up in this uh, presentation they gave. Yeah. Because uh, that question came up, interference, if you have multiple units. Yes. And, and, and apparently they don't interfere with each other. The, the signal from one just looks like noise to the other. So they, they would actually take several of these and point them at each other. And they would each range just fine. Yeah. Without causing so that's the, the advantage is when you start using multiple units. There's some problems with using multiple units, but we'll go. We'll get there too. Yeah. <laughs> now this is the um, so this is the newer chip in this family. Um, uh, I don't know if we have any samples in the club at the moment or not. No. But no. Has, have they even? I, I haven't even seen where they've offered this. Right. Now. Do, it's coming. Coming. It's coming. <laughs> but the, what's what's there's some interesting things at least to me about them. Um, this, this new one has a programmable field of view. So you can actually go in there and say, I want to use these spads or these spads, and you can change the vary, you can vary the, the width of the cone that, of light that it's looking at. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting was this uh, thresholding. So they're made for really low power, uh, battery powered applications embedded. And uh, Ron actually reminded me a view when they got into this because you can set these newer ones up um, to trigger. So you can have, in a, a, if you have a, like a, a high-end consumer circuit or something, battery power energy is really important. You can you can uh, put your micro to sleep. You can set an alarm in the sky. Put your microprocessor to sleep. This guy will very very delicately sip on the battery, right? 
set it a pulse, and whenever the right condition is hit, it'll wake up your micro and say, hey, I got triggered. Yeah, there's something out here. There's something, here, here's the result I just got. So, um, and they have these triggers in this device where you can, you can, um, uh, is, is somebody, um, uh, does somebody just go beyond the distance threshold? Does somebody just come into the distance threshold? Is there an object within this window of distance? Is there an object outside of this window of distance? So you can, you can set this thing to trigger on a change of state from what it's seeing in terms of measuring distance. And I don't know, what, what was it, like microwatts that it's drawing? Yeah, it's, it's something ridiculously small. It'll just sit there forever. And so it, it could detect, like, say, a duck on, say, a pool. A pool. A pool. <laughs> <laughs> you have the duck ejector. Okay. That's another a, store. I have a duck problem, so I need some kind of duck ejector. <laughs> duck ejector. From my pool. That's better than the, the pool cleaner that follows the duck's performance. Remember that demo you showed with the three LIDARs? And yeah. The, and yep. Following around? Yeah. Uh, look for ducks and shoot a Nerf gun at them. <laughs> <laughs> or kids that are doing graffiti. Oh, and by the way, spray. a pool cleaner won't uh, scare away the ducks. My neighbor said they watched the afternoon. The duck, they started the pool cleaner up. The duck rode the pool cleaner hose. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> seriously. I've, I've, seen, I've seen something like that, but the, the next video I want to do is I want to have my wife uh, take, a, take a camera and as one of the two ducks, because in the morning and the afternoon, that's when they do their business in my pool. So, um, so I want to have her uh, uh, taking a video of this, and, and well, they're just gracefully flowing around, and then she can shout, pull, and I can get the hose, because when you squirt them with the hose, they take off. <laughs> It's, it's pretty cool, actually. But if I could automate that, it would be a good business. And then the rest of it is, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But um, So that's, uh, yeah, they talk about applications. Soap dispensers, flushers, yeah. barcode scanners. Okay. So that, um, Excellent. It's an inglorious end to my presentation. That's yeah. it.